Welcome to EDEC Risk Institute. Today we are going to talk about risk premium in equity markets. We first are going to define what equity risk premium are, and then we are going to talk about cap-weighted benchmarks and their ability or inability to allow investors to harvest those risk premium in an efficient way. Okay. Let's recognize that all the many individual stocks that we are looking at in the marketplace, the reason why they are attractive is because they earn a risk premium, and the risk premium that they earn, they earn it from an exposure with respect to underlying rewarded risk factors. And these risk factors are macro or micro risk factors, and we don't necessarily see them, but the reason that the risk premium exists is because they are associated with these underlying factors. One way to think about it is to think about aliments versus nutrients. We all know that when we think about food, it's all about nutrients. The kind of food that we eat doesn't matter too much as long as eventually they allow us to get, to get access to the right underlying nutrients. These nutrients could be vitamins, minerals, lipids, carbohydrates, and so on and so forth. Well, that's exactly the same for um, stock markets. What matters is systematic factor exposure. System specific risk is uncompensated. Another way to think about it is that there's no reward for eating junk. So whatever is useful when you're eating food is the part that contains the meaningful nutrients. Now, think about the commonly accepted risk factors in equity markets just like we can think about the major nutrients when we're looking at food. The first one is the big market exposure. You can think about fats as being one of the major nutrients that sometimes we get too much of. Then the next one is value exposure. You can think about protein, for example, as being a useful nutrient. Size, the size factor has been uh, introduced as the third most meaningful factors explaining differences in risk and returns across stocks. That's somewhat similar to minerals. And in the same way, then you have momentum, you can have low vol, uh, you can have liquidity, you can have quality, and others. And when we talk about them as being commonly accepted, of course, we have to recognize that there still is a lot of debate in terms of what are the most meaningful factors, how much they are rewarded, but the bottom line is, more often than not, the short list of factors is regarded as, you know, the few most important factors. Now, the next step is to think about what is a healthy equity portfolio, just like you would think about a healthy meal or a healthy diet. Well, a healthy equity portfolio is a portfolio that allows you, as an investor, to efficiently harvest all of those risk premia. Again, this is exactly similar to you trying to put together a healthy meal and a healthy meal will allow you to get access to all of these underlying nutrients in the right proportion and combination. So the outstanding question is how do we do this in practice? How do we invest assets in these many individual stocks in such a way to efficiently harvest risk premium? Well, the default option to achieve this objective is to use a cap-weighted benchmark or a cap-weighted index as a benchmark either for passive money management or for active money management. Now, even though cap-weighted benchmarks are used as a default uh, options for active and passive money management, these cap-weighted benchmarks suffer from a number of shortcomings that we are going to discuss. It should be recognized, though, that they also enjoy a number of uh, the key advantages, which you know, probably explain why they have become so popular in investment management practice. First of all, cap-weighted indices weight stocks proportional to their market cap. So that's very simple. And this simplicity actually translates into the fact that a cap-weighted benchmark is a buy-and-hold strategy. If today you're holding on a portfolio which is cap-weighted, Tomorrow, you still will be cap-weighted unless there is any change in index constituency. 
So that's a good thing, simplicity in terms of implementation. There's also a macro consistency property about it. So in other words, if you're holding a cap-weighted index, you're actually holding what the market holds on aggregate. So you behave like the market as a whole. So this is all good and nice, but the bad news is, well, the bad news is it has been documented in a number of academic studies, and probably one of the earliest of such academic studies was the paper by Augen and Baker, 91. And in that paper, here is what they showed. They showed that cap-weighted stock portfolios are inefficient investments. So they are simple and nice, which is good, but they do not allow you to get the highest possible reward in exchange for the risks that are taken. Even the most comprehensive cap-weighted portfolios occupy positions inside the efficient set. This is one of the key findings in this academic study. Well, let's take a look at a similar finding. So in this graph, we are showing the S&P 500 index, which is the collection of the largest cap stocks in the US. And then we locate the S&P 500 index in comparison with the efficient frontier, which is drawn from optimally holding the 500 stocks within the S&P 500 index. And the conclusion is striking. The S&P 500 index is nowhere near the efficient frontier. It's very far from the efficient frontier. And what this suggests, well, that suggests that there's a huge opportunity cost in terms of potential return for a given level of risk for anyone holding the S&P 500 index as an investable portfolio or as an investment benchmark. Now, this analysis is somewhat deceiving. I'm not claiming that anyone should be able to hold portfolio one, two, three, or four, or five on this efficient set. Those portfolios are actually too good to be true. And the reason why they are too good to be true is because this is an in-sample analysis. In other words, these portfolios have been computed ex post using the full sample information. So that makes it for an, an unfair comparison with respect to the S&P 500 index for which you, know, you don't need any look-ahead bias, just a cap-weighted portfolio of all existing stocks in your investment universe. So the question is, is the air a fair portfolio, easy to implement without any look-ahead bias, without having to possess and utilize information about future returns? A very simple portfolio strategy that you can be holding at any point in time that would give you better than the S&P 500 index, that would give you a portfolio that would be somewhere closer to the efficient frontier. Well, the answer to this question is yes. It actually turns out that these cap-weighted indices are dominated by extremely simple, also known as naive, equally weighted benchmarks. Just take a look at this picture, which is extracted from another academic paper documenting the inefficiency of cap-weighted portfolios as investment benchmarks. What you find on this picture is the difference in Sharpe ratio between an equally weighted benchmark and a cap-weighted benchmark based on the same stocks. Now, you find 53 different dots on this picture, and these 53 different dots represent the 53 regions or countries within the MSCI database. And the conclusion is, all of those numbers are positive. And what that means? is that the sharp ratio of an, equally, of, of an equally weighted benchmark is always, always, at least on this sample period, always greater than the sharp ratio of a cap-weighted benchmark for the same investment universe. There's no exception whatsoever. We've tried in 53 countries, and in all 53 cases, equally weighted was better than cap-weighted. Well, this is kind of interesting because equally weighted is not really smart. It's not like it's a super smart weighting scheme. It is as simple as it gets, right? It's one over n. You give me n stocks, I invest equally weighted. Give me 100 stocks, I go 1% in each one of these stocks. Well, it actually turns out that the situation is even worse than this. Not only naive 
portfolios are better than cap weighted, but even monkey portfolios are actually smarter than cap weighted. So what exactly do we mean by monkey portfolio? What is this monkey business we're talking about? Well, the monkey business is the outcome of, of a very simple statistical experiment. Yet again, another academic paper is written by some of our colleagues on the inefficiency of cap-weighted benchmarks. So what the authors have done in this paper is they have randomly simulated computer-generated monkeys picking portfolio weights. So whenever a stock is given, they assign 1% and they put the stock back. So let's say you have 100 stocks. You take one stock and you assign 1%, you put it back. You take another stock, you assign 1% and you put it back again. And you do it 100 times until you compose 100% of your portfolio. Now, of course, because you're putting stocks back, it can happen that you pick the same stocks twice or three times or maybe four times which eventually will result into the stock being weighted 2% or 3% or 4%. Okay, but that's kind of unusual. So the allocation to all these stocks will be fairly even. Now what you show here, this distribution that looks like a Gaussian distribution here, it's the distribution of sharp ratio of all of these computer generated monkeys. Well, or the portfolio held by these monkeys. Now, the average of these portfolios, this solid vertical bar here, is nothing but the sharp ratio of the equally weighted portfolio. On average, the monkeys are holding an equally weighted portfolio. Now, guess what? If you wonder where on earth would be the cap-weighted benchmark on this picture, well, here is where the cap-weighted benchmark is. The sharp ratio of the cap-weighted benchmark is not only significantly lower than the average of the monkeys, but it's actually lower than the worst of those monkeys. So that's a pretty striking conclusion. Cap-weighted indices provide a poor diversification of unrewarded specific risks, and that's one of the main reasons why they generate poor risk-adjusted performance. Well, additionally, we can also make the case that cap-weighted indices also provide a wrong exposure or a suboptimal exposure with respect to rewarded systematic uh, risk exposures. If you think about the cap-weighted benchmark, it's going to overweight the largest cap stocks and the growth stocks by construction. Well, guess what? Academic research, including the well-known research by Fama and French, has documented that the rewarded tilts were actually the small cap tilts and the value tilt. So with a cap-weighted benchmark, not only you're holding a portfolio that's too concentrated, not as well diversified as it should be, but on top of that, you end up holding too much of those stocks that tend to underperform over the long run. 